Where can you find the worst income inequality in America? There are many communities where the haves and the have-nots are living right next to each other, from San Francisco to New York and all across rural America. But the starkest inequality is actually here in Puerto Rico, an island known for its beautiful beaches, its tropical weather, and also for a shocking 43% poverty rate. This poverty exists side by side with some of the most extreme wealth in the whole world. Since 2012, more than 5,000 crypto traders, real estate developers, and other wealthy Americans have moved to the island. I'm moving to Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico is a place that's near and dear to my heart because it's where my family's from. It's where I lived as a kid and have some of my earliest memories. Yep, that's me in the red and white bikini. So I wanted to find out, how did the gap between rich and poor on this beautiful island become so wide? What happens when a government surrenders itself entirely to the 1%? To answer that question, I'll talk to local residents, investigative journalists, lawmakers, and activists who've been digging into this issue for years. This is The Classroom for More Perfect Union. And today, we're talking about how America's elites are plundering Puerto Rico. Before we get to these guys... I'm moving to Puerto Rico. We decided to come to Puerto Rico. I live in Puerto Rico, and I haven't been wearing closed-toed shoes since Thanksgiving. We have to go back and give you a brief history of Puerto Rico's financial relationship with the mainland. For a large part of Puerto Rico's history, the economy was agricultural, relying on rich sugar plantations, which were exploited first by Spanish colonists and later by American bankers. Then in the mid-1940s, the local government wanted to modernize, so they used tax incentives to attract investment from industries in mainland America. In 1976, the American government passed Section 936, which exempted U.S. companies operating in Puerto Rico from paying federal income tax. This led to a sort of economic dependence on the mainland that proved catastrophic in 1996, when the U.S. government decided to phase out Section 936 over a 10-year period. Without the generous tax breaks, foreign investment began to flee the island. By 2006, a recession hit that's still going on today. In order to make up for the losses and provide citizens with basic necessities, the Puerto Rican government borrowed heavily, racking up $72 billion in debt. Puerto Rico couldn't file for bankruptcy because, as a U.S. territory, it doesn't have the same insolvency laws as states do. So in 2016, the Obama administration passed a law called PROMESA, appointing a widely hated financial oversight management board to determine ways the island can pay back the debt, imposing severe austerity measures, which have seriously pissed people off and hurt locals. And over the last decade, I saw several different crises compound. A recession, followed by a debt crisis, a natural disaster, severe austerity measures, another natural disaster, and all of this left the island reeling, in debt, and in need of economic stimulus. This set the stage for one of the most short-sighted efforts the local government has taken yet to attract money from the mainland. In 2012, conservative governor Luis Fortuño's administration passed two laws, Act 20 and Act 22. These laws offered massive tax breaks to private investors. In 2019, they were rolled into one law called Act 60. Under Act 60, certain companies pay a 4% corporate tax rate, and they don't pay any taxes on income from capital gains, interest, or dividends. That's why these guys are moving here. I moved to Puerto Rico first and foremost for the huge tax incentives. Any money you make from investing is gonna be taxed at a big fat zero. It's one, it's one vertical. Yeah. It's one. It's a big one. To qualify, you have to buy a home and donate money to a local charity. And most importantly, you have to move to Puerto Rico and actually live there at least six months out of the year. We live in California. We it's lived in California. Lived. Well, we still do. Part. No, no, we, li we lived so, in California. Lived in, we lived in California. So how has this influx of rich Americans affected the island? Margarita Gandia is a longtime resident and real estate agent in Old San Juan, which is one of the most impacted neighborhoods. Well, we don't have a neighborhood anymore. The only thing you'll find is uh, gates with a lot of locks. Many Act 60 beneficiaries have been buying up properties and turning them into short-term rentals, and they're doing it so aggressively that they've completely transformed the housing market. Un apartamento de renta de dos habitaciones amueblado con su balcón, buena localización, por lo menos va a ser $4,500 o $5,000 mensuales. These are Manhattan prices. 
The median income in Puerto Rico is less than $22,000 a year for an entire family. Y aquí hay gente que pueden pagar eh, rentas corporativas, una corporación, un LLC. Y que esta gente la van a desplazar. Los mudan a otro edificio sectional fuera del viejo San Juan. They're snatching up other public buildings too, and they're getting a massive discount. I went to the neighborhood of Puerta de Tierra with Adrián González Costa. He's a spokesperson for Puerto Rico's Independence Party and a vocal critic of the tax incentives. The school that was closed in 2013 was sold to another Act 22 investor for short-term rental. It's a three-story building and it was sold for $500,000. It was sold on 2018, but they haven't done anything. So the myth that they are buying empty buildings, improving them, it's a myth. It's just garbage out, outside. There is a building next to the school and the most cheap apartment there is near the million dollar. So a whole school, half a million dollar, and across the street, an apartment for a million dollar. It was a gift. It's like a donation for the investor. So what was the logic here? How was luring rich people in with massive tax breaks supposed to help the people of Puerto Rico? Influx of capital and jobs. These are type A individuals. They don't sit around watching TV all day. They want to go out and they're investing in the local economy. So how is that going? Luis Valentin Ortiz is a journalist with the Centro de Periodismo Investigativo, a nonprofit media organization that conducted an investigation into Act 60 and its predecessor, Act 22. Back in 2021, we started to receive a lot of tips and complaints about individuals uh, who had tax incentives. So we came up with a database uh, on all of the uh, people who has this incentive and we decided to take a closer look into them and see do they have a company? Are they cre creating jobs? What kind of jobs have these tax beneficiaries created? Mostly related to themselves. For example, uh, a chauffeur, somebody who cleans the house, a nana that will take care of the kids. Uh, we actually spoke to one of them and their stories were horrible as well because they were mistreated, you know, they were, they were not paid well. And the jobs weren't just poorly paid, there weren't very many of them. The last study by the government showed Act 22 only created 40,000 jobs. The average income of those was in the range of 19,000 yearly. $19,000 a year? Yeah. That was, which is below the poverty line? Of course, yes. If you talk to the government, they'll come back and say, just because they're here, we're winning. Just because he goes and spends 20, 30, whatever in a restaurant, we're winning. But that's, you know, if you talk to some economists, they'll say that that's a horrible way to, to see the whole thing. It's a horrible way to see it because it doesn't account for all the costs that these tax breaks are imposing on the island. Act 60 beneficiaries are encroaching on public space too. We spoke with Representative Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez, a longtime advocate of Puerto Rican issues. One reason I'm very passionate about issues regarding Puerto Rico is because my family's from Puerto Rico. I grew up around Puerto Rico and my family's still there. And seeing the degree of inequality on the island and the way that people in Puerto Rico have been starved of their public resources, all because the wealthy are free riding on public systems and not paying into them is something that is just so incredibly unacceptable. Puerto Rico has a very sacred principle that is enshrined in law that all beaches are public land. But a lot of these speculators and developers are starting to cut off and create choke points so that native people and the everyday people that come to the island cannot access one of our most precious natural resources, which is our beaches. This is the Dorado Beach Plantation, and we're gonna see if we can go to the beach. Hola, buenos días. Desde aquí se puede llegar a la playa? No. Esto un club. No beach, no beach. This is Pedro Cardona Roig, an urban planner who has become famous on the island for criticizing policies like Act 22. Construyen verjas, piscinas, y cosas dentro del dominio público, en parte algunos porque no conocen el concepto de la forma que está articulado en Puerto Rico, aunque existe en Estados Unidos, pero como Puerto Rico se ve como un lugar sin orden, todo es posible. 
So I'm in this area called Quebradilla, which is on the western side of Puerto Rico. A local activist is just posting from this site, alerting people of construction that appears to be taking place here. It looks like they're starting to clear the land for construction. This is actually an archaeological site, and it's illegal to build on top of these areas. You might be asking yourself, where has the government been? And this is the question Luisa's investigation was asking back in 2021. We asked the government, hey, how many times have you found uh, non-compliance from these guys? How many reports have they submitted? Um, can you give us those reports? And that's when the whole thing started to crack open because they basically one day said, hey, look, we don't have any information on our side. They did not oversee or they did not audit at all. None of these guys. It's like America Light. The government is totally broke, but this works in your favor because they can't pay people to keep an eye on you. Is this cool or what? What makes things even worse is that many of these tax breaks don't apply to local Puerto Ricans themselves. Una persona beneficiaria de ley 60 tributa al 3% ahora, pero los que llegaron antes tributan a cero. Así que nosotros competimos tributando entre el 33 y el 36%, que es a lo que yo tributo, compito con personas que están al 0 y al 3. It's as if the island and its resources are only there to serve rich Americans. And it's at the heart of what many locals are angry about. They're settling, displacing, and owning. Not the old way of colonizing, but the result is the same. This is Rosa Segui Cordero, who's part of a new political party focused on advocating for decolonization and building an economy that works for everyone. The problem is that doing one thing, like allegedly bringing foreign capital, it's not an integrated economic development plan. It does not translate to adequate jobs, nor better paying jobs, nor economic growth. To the contrary, more than $25 billion are not taken into our economy from foreign companies because of these tax breaks. And the government is continuously saying that they need more revenues, that it's in a bankruptcy proceeding. Driving around the island, you can see broken infrastructure everywhere. If Act 60 investors are bringing in money, why aren't these things being fixed? Because that money that they're bringing never reaches the government coffers. They'll consume, they still use streets, uh, services, public safety. So they're, you know, they exert some pressure on the government, but they don't give back proportionally as much as Puerto Rico taxpayers will pay, you know, uh, the government. We don't pay high taxes. Yes, we do pay high taxes here in Puerto Rico. Again, that's 33% for Luis, but only 3% for these guys. I like it. With a struggling economy and public policies like these, it's no wonder that 500,000 local residents left Puerto Rico between 2010 and 2020. Nosotros tenemos un aparato gubernamental que ha abandonado lo que es la defensa y el análisis del interés público. Es una mentalidad neoliberal, pero a un nivel muy exagerado. Y está creando un urbanismo neoliberal. Que no lo visto. But what can be done about any of this? Four Democratic members of the House, including Representative Ocasio-Cortez, called on the Government Accountability Office to review Act 60. In order to legally not pay these taxes, especially federal taxes, you have to reside in Puerto Rico. And so what we're seeing is the potential of people with huge amounts of money, from crypto billionaires to real estate speculators, who are claiming to actually reside in Puerto Rico when in reality they may not. And that might mean that they are skirting out from paying huge amounts of taxes based on false claims. And that should matter not just to people on the island of Puerto Rico, but it should also matter to everyday Americans, because when it comes to federal taxes and any of that revenue, those are our health care, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and more. 
In July, the IRS identified 100 wealthy individuals who may have been claiming the tax benefits without meeting requirements. They're going to be investigating many of them, and the local government is now helping. But there's still a lot more to be done. Some think statehood would give them more power over federal policy that affects them, while others are so sick of the decades of wealth extraction from corporate America that they want a clean break to forge their own path independently. And what Puerto Rico needs right now more than ever are people who actually care care about Puerto Rico. And we can incentivize that in our tax system, our laws, and our environmental protections as well.